Awesome. Um, thanks, Jason. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about our uh, metrics uh, infrastructure and, and architecture and how we've scaled this system to process uh, trillions of points a day. So I'm going to start just by sort of putting it to you. Um, what, what does a trillion mean to you? Like, if you try to visualize a trillion of something, what does that look like? So, um, I, I, you know, maybe you have some ideas. Um, one way to think about it is it's uh, 31,000 years is, is a trillion seconds. Um, so that's a, a pretty, pretty long time. Um, a trillion pennies go up to the moon and back about three times. Um, so we're, we're talking about a, a lot of data, and, and that sort of begs the question, where is all this data coming from? Um, you, if you went to our, our keynote this morning, you heard from our CTO, Alexi, about uh, some of the, the sources of, of this data and this explosion that we're seeing. He referred to it as the, the Cambrian explosion of data. Um, and we see, as we add these numbers up, as we think about um, having uh, hundreds of, of apps, um, thousands of hosts, tens of containers, uh, you know, a point per second, um, Adding that all together, we, we actually come up with, with a trillion points, even just uh, for a single you know, medium to, to large uh, customer. And some of what's underlying uh, this growth um, is the, the decreasing life cycle of our, our infrastructure. Uh, we're moving from this world where we had uh, you know, the, the sort of classical uh, analogy of pets, not cattle. Uh, we're, we moved into the, the cattle world where uh, we stopped giving our infrastructure uh, cute nicknames and, and we thought of it more as, as a herd. Uh, and now we're moving into this world where things are, are living for um, not just uh, for, for shorter than, than weeks or days, but in the realm of, of minutes or, or seconds or, or milliseconds in the case of, of things like um, cloud functions. At the same time, we have this incredible explosion in the granularity of the data that we're looking at. Our expectation of the level of detail that we want to get out of our observable, observability systems, our monitoring platforms, and our metrics uh, is, is really just exploded as we've thought more and more about what kind of insight we can gain from this data. So we're seeing this decreasing life cycle coupled with this increase in the granularity leading to uh, this, this world of, of trillions of, of metrics per, per day. So these are some um, performance uh, mantras. These are things that uh, were, were sort of come up with by the, the performance engineering community, um, credited to uh, Crane Hansen and, and uh, Craig Hansen and Pat Crane. Um, I, I sort of came across them uh, via Brendan Gregg, uh, an incredibly uh, smart uh, engineer and, and author currently working at uh, Netflix, but came through uh, Sun. Uh, highly recommend um, looking into to his work. But I'll be using these to sort of frame uh, some of the decisions that we've made and some of the patterns that we've used to scale our system to, to that volume of, of trillions of points a day. So I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, our, our architecture sort of at a high level. Uh, I'll, I'll do a bit of a deeper dive on, on some of our data storage uh, choices. Uh, we'll talk about how we handle synchronization across all of those data stores. Um, and then we'll dive into uh, how we leverage approximation to get sort of even deeper insights than we get from our, our traditional metrics. And finally, we'll talk about how that approximation and aggregation combine to enable us to build an even more flexible uh, architecture. So diving into the, the architecture overview, so this is sort of the, the high level view. We have uh, you know, in the upper, uh, upper left, I have to orient myself what, what way you're seeing that. The upper left, um, where, where our metric sources are coming in, we have uh, you know, things like the agent, our API, our various cloud and web integrations coming into our intake system. They're getting stored in a variety of different data stores. Then the query system is pulling the data out of those different data stores, pulling it together, feeding it back to you, and feeding it back to you in a, a few different ways through APIs, through dashboards, um, and then through monitors and alerts. So one of the first sort of iterations you can sort of add to this model is, is adding the, the query caching uh, aspect. So this is sort of a, uh, the, the first thing that you might think of in this system is, is well, time series data is highly cacheable. It's uh, data that at the is very volatile at the most recent end, but as you look back historically, that data isn't changing as much anymore. So it's very easy to, to keep that data in, in a cache. 
Um, so this is sort of a necessary condition for, for improving the performance of our system. Uh, but we find that it's not sufficient um, in one part because uh, you know, often what you care about is the most recent data. So we, you know, we can't cache the data that's, as it's just coming in. And uh, we also see that you know, as you're exploring the data, as you're debugging different issues, you're going to be diving into different resolutions and different filters and things like that. And that you know, quickly um, sort of busts through the cache, and, and we have to go fetch different uh, segments of that data um, for the first time. But mapping this to our, our performance mantras, we think about this from the perspective of do it, but don't do it again. So leverage caching as much as you can. Like I said, it's a, a necessary but sort of not sufficient um, approach. So we're going to zoom in a bit on the, the intake and the data store uh, part of this diagram and see a little bit more detail about what's happening there in order to answer these kinds of um, high volume, real time queries quickly. So here we see uh, we've zoomed in the intake system, fans out data into a couple of different uh, Kafka queues. And then from there, it goes across many different data stores. The query system then pulls that all back together and uh, gives you your results, whether it's through a monitor or, or a dashboard. And the important thing to uh, notice here is that um, there's, there's this wide variety of, of sort of uh, uh, heterogeneous um, data store types that are all reading from, from a unified topic in that you know, we really want this, this intake part to be as simple and as, as uh, low latency as possible um, so that we can make sure that we're capturing data with, with minimal risk of loss. Um, and, and that brings us again back to performance mantras, thinking about doing it later. Uh, we want to maximize, um, we want to maximize that uptime and, and minimize the, the upfront processing that we're, we're doing in, as we get the data into Kafka where we can work with it much, much more easily. So how do we leverage Kafka at, at Datadog? Um, you know, we do use, uh, we make heavy use of, of the uh, built-in partitioning system um, in a couple of different ways. So we, we started simply by partitioning by customer. So that gave us a really nice uh, isolation where you know, if a certain customer was scaling up, we could scale up the volume of, of uh, readers off of that partition uh, without it necessarily spilling into other, um, other partitions. Um, that became sort of not sufficient. We needed to take another level of, of partitioning that data, so we went to metric. Um, that is also actually not sufficient for us in the long term. What we're seeing is individual metrics uh, actually are at a volume that they can't be handled, or it's, it's not reasonable to sort of scale you know, an individual partition to handle some of the largest metrics in our system. And that's where we're actually in the process right now of building something even more dynamic to balance the workload across our systems and, and make it much more evenly distributed and avoid uh, hot spotting by metric. So doing it concurrently is, is the, the thing that we're, we're getting out of our, our use of Kafka. We're able to uh, use uh, independently horiz uh, horizontally scalable data stores uh, all reading off of the same Kafka topics, whether they're points or, or tag set data, and uh, able to really customize those data stores to the specific use case and the specific function that each of them are uh, trying to perform. So we're going to dive now into uh, exactly what those functions are and how we sort of map um, those functions onto storage and, and database technologies. Coming back to this model of, of trillions of points per day, um, we want to think about how do we translate this into a volume of data and how do we use that to how we think about um, the, the storage layer and, and the databases that we're using. So we think about this, what we're storing essentially is an eight byte float for each of these things. And then we want to add a little bit of overhead for, for storing the tags that kind of, kind of gets amortized over all of the data. And, and we end up with an estimate of, of something like 10 terabytes a day to store this um, trillions of, of points a day. That brings us to how do we store, what, what, what are sort of the technology options that we have for storing this data? These are some uh, really common um, options. We're using AWS sort of as an example, as a reference point, um, as it's you know, widely used. People are highly familiar with it. And you can sort of think about um, the different options based on these different tiers that, that uh, 
AWS provides, but this sort of uh, goes across different cloud providers or, or even um, data, cent data center kinds of, of architectures. Um, these are you know, listed in, you, you, know, you see, uh, in ascending order of, of latency and descending order of price. These things are, are uh, inversely related. So what if you know, we wanted to store all of this data in, in RAM, for instance? This is sort of like the, the upper bound in terms of, of how we could answer these queries. We could do it really, really quickly if, if we just put everything in RAM and said, you know, th this will be great. It'll be super fast. Um, there's nothing faster. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, with some margin of uh, uh, reasonableness. Um, to, in order to do that, we need to use a, a instance type like the AWS X1E 32XL. We need to use 80 of them. Um, that comes out to something like $300,000 a month, um, which is a lot. Um, it, but it would be really fast. Um, and, and then this is also not accounting for, for indexes overhead. This is not accounting for uh, redundancy. Um, you know, this, if, if one of those 80 nodes goes down, maybe you lose 1 80th of your data. That's not acceptable. Um, and, and of course, we have even more data than a single month. This is all just modeling a, a single month's worth of, worth of data. So we really, this brings us to the idea that we need to take a, a hybrid approach. We need to leverage different kinds of storage in order to meet our performance and our, our efficiency goals. So in order to, to think about this, we want to think about what kinds of queries we need to answer uh, in order to tailor our, our data storage uh, to um, the, the use case and, and get the most efficiency out of it. So these are the four sort of common queries that we need to answer from our, our system, our data stores. So the first one being describe tags. This is essentially what is driving the dropdowns in your uh, Datadog UI. If you're selecting a filter or a group, uh, list of metrics, et cetera. That's the first thing that you're doing to sort of craft your query. We need to have that data available relatively quickly so that you, know, you can sort of explore your data quickly. We have the tag index, and we have a tag inverted index. So you can think of this as two sides of the same coin. Um, we have the tag index, which is mapping an ID to a, set of, a unique set of tags in our system. And on the flip side, we have an inverted index. If you're familiar with that term, um, you might sort of have an intuition about what that means. But uh, to spell it out, it's really taking the, all of the different individual tags and groups and saying, um, you know, this tag maps to this, time, this list of time series IDs. So if I say I want to do a filter on you know, availability zone US East 1A, give me all of the time series IDs that, that match that specific filter. And then the, the last one here is, is our core um, point store. This is the uh, mapping of a time series ID to the point, to a, a eight byte float. And that's you know, an incredibly high volume of data. Uh, and we've really distilled it to, to sort of its simplest possible form. So it's really important for us to think about only indexing exactly what we need in order to be able to answer these queries efficiently. It's really easy to over-index data. You want to start trading your uh, write volume to get better read performance. That's what indexing is for. But then you start, uh, you know, if, you, if you're over-indexing the data, you're going to end up, you know, a, a float is a really small value. If you have too many indexes for the same float value, it's going to quickly dominate the, the storage volume of your system. So coming back to this table, we're going to look at these three choices as the ones that we've sort of focused on in terms of their price and performance um, effectiveness. Uh, obviously, RAM, super fast, super useful, really great for things like caches, really recent data, things like that. Uh, we found that local SSDs really provide a much better um, price performance uh, point for us than uh, things like EBS. So you see, like, EBS is. Uh, you know, an order of magnitude more expensive than local SSDs. It has an order of magnitude uh, higher latency uh, than local SSDs. But of course, EBS comes with a ton of amazing um, tooling and, and features around snapshotting. So we've had to rebuild a lot of that in order to leverage the performance of, of local SSDs in, in AWS. But um, it's, it's really been, been worth the investment for us. That's sort of a, a trade off that, that you have to make for, for yourself. But we've found a lot of value in, in being able to do that. Um, and then, of course, we make use of, of S3 because it is uh, incredibly durable and uh, just offers 
you know, really cheap, effective storage that, you know, we know that data will be there effectively forever. So we're going to map these storage technologies back to the kinds of queries and the data stores that we need to answer. And what you'll see is that what we've done is we've split up the kinds of queries that we need to do based on the time ranges that we expect to need to cover them and mapped those time ranges onto different um, storage uh, choices. So you see uh, the persistence uh, on the right and the, the type of storage that we're choosing on the left, where you know, when we're looking at RAM, we're looking at the last few hours, we're looking at SSDs. Hello? Um, we're looking at SSDs on the, the order of days, and we're looking at S3 on the order of, of months and, and years. And then we can add another layer on that, and we can look at the technology that we're putting on top of our storage on these uh, storage platforms. On the, more, in the lo higher levels of persistence and, and common things like, like Redis for caching, um, we're, we're leveraging open source technologies. And then you see um, the, the things that are right in the, the critical path in the highest volume um, data in the, the really the um, most uh, time sensitive kinds of queries, we're looking at storing things in RAM and we're using uh, actually in-house uh, built data stores. We, th this is sort of the, the core of the platform and, and that you know, we've really found that we need to own that part in order to be able to answer the volume of queries that, that we need to at the volume of, of data um, e efficiently. So what we're taking away from this is, um, you know, in order to, to do this efficiently, to do it cheaper, we're, we're really mixing the, the open source and in-house, we're mixing the different kinds of storage technologies to put it all together in a way that meets the performance requirements at, at each sort of level of persistence. So, of course, you know, thinking about, you know, using all of these different data stores and, and spreading this data ac across systems this way, it leads you to, to the question of, of how do you handle synchronization in, in a world that's, that's so widely distributed? Um, and, and the really critical point to think in this area is actually in the um, area of monitors and, and alerts. Uh, so in, in a human latency sense, the eventual consistency that we get out of, out of our data stores in Kafka uh, tends to, um, tends to you know, meet human latency requirements. It doesn't always meet the requirements of our monitoring system. And in particular, it's important uh, for us to ensure that we're not going to trigger false positive alerts. It's really critical that we know that we have all of the data that we need in order to have confidence that when we send you all a page, that, that, is, that we have everything that we need to, to know 100% that that is all the data and that we're not, you know, there's not data you know, lagging in our pipeline somewhere, et cetera. Um, so it, it's really thinking about what that evaluation period is and how do we track all of the data through the system to know that we have it all to be able to um, monitor it and uh, talk and, and tell you uh, this is definitely something is definitely wrong. And the way that we do that is using um, what we can sort of think of as a, a heartbeat pattern. Um, this is sort of a common pattern in systems. You might be familiar with it from tracking like replication lag in your database if you've used like Percona Toolkit and Percona Heartbeat, things like that. Um, and what we do is we, we do this as far outside of our system as possible, uh, you know, even going so far as, as to generate this data from a different data center, trying to mimic the experience of your agents or, uh, you know, your services calling our APIs, et cetera, uh, in, in order to track the full round trip latency through the system. And, uh, and then we look for that data that we injected synthetically on the other side to know, you know that the data has made it all the way through and that the, the last point um, has made it through each of the different systems that I've talked about and that it's all come together at the end before we say, okay, now we can go ahead and monitor this alert. And this happens you know, every single second we're looking to see, okay, do we have everything up to this second? Do we have everything up to this second? So really what we're focused on is, you know, we're building synchronization in the system, but we're building the minimal amount of synchronization that we need. Uh, we we want to do as little synchronization as possible and, and uh, avoid that because as soon as we get deeply into this area, you know, you start to get into really hairy uh, coordination problems and, and we want to avoid that as much as possible. 
So now let's talk a little bit about um, how we actually have leveraged approximation in our architecture in order to uh, get even deeper insights, moving a little bit beyond some of the traditional uh, metrics that, that you might be thinking of and, and into sort of a, a new kind of, of metric uh, and, and how that's actually enabled us to, to scale to even more data. So you, you think about um, these are sort of your traditional types of metrics, uh, you know, in stats D and, and whatnot. Everything sort of boils down to counters and, and gauges. Uh, and we talk about them in terms of uh, the aggregation because that's sort of what defines them. They're either counters are aggregated by sum over time or gauges which are aggregated by the last value you've seen. These are continuous functions. They're aggregated by last seen or average over time. Um, and some examples of counters, you know, requests, errors, total time spent, if you're thinking about it like a stopwatch where you're just continually accru accruing time. Um, gauges, continuous functions, these are things like system metrics or queue length, um, where there's always a value and you're just taking readings from that value. So how we aggregate this, uh, you know, you, you actually derive the meaning from the data based on how you aggregate it. You get very different kinds of meanings. These are four different time series over time, 10 time intervals. Uh, you think about, uh, some, if you think about this data as counters, you get you know, one set of output. If you think about it as a gauge and you average that data over time, you get another set of outputs. And if you aggregate it by the last value seen, you get a third set of outputs. So you're actually giving meaning to the data by how you choose to uh, think about um, the data and, and the aggregation that you uh, apply to it based on, on that type. So uh, how does that apply to approximation? Well, we're thinking about this in uh, terms of, of aggregation. And what if we want even more sophisticated kinds of aggregation? And we want to think about um, being able to answer questions not just about uh, the average latency um, or the max latency, but we actually want to aggregate by percentile. We want to know what the 95 fifth percentile latency or the 99th percentile request size is, uh, we actually need to uh, take a, a different approach to how we aggregate our data. And going back to this example, again, we're going to take another pass at this same data set and derive a completely different um, set of meaning out of it. Uh, and what we are looking at here is we're looking at either the median or the 90th percentile value across both time and space of this data. And in order to do that, we have to have to take every single data, data point in this uh, set, and we have to sort it. And then we have to examine the rank uh, value out of the, the set for the median. The median rank here is between the, the 20th and 21st value. So that's a 5. Averaging two fives is a 5. If you look at the 90th percentile value, that's the 36th ranked value. In that case, that's a 32. So you know, this is a latency. Uh, data set, you know, our 90th percentile latency is, you know, 32 seconds or something. So you can imagine that aggregating this data can be really expensive. You're looking at every single data point and you're sorting it and then you're looking at, you know, a particular rank. And a single um, new value in that, uh, in that series can actually dramatically change what that uh, ranked value ends up looking like. So how do we do this uh, sort of efficiently and, and apply sort of our, our can, we, can we do this more cheaply than, than storing every single point, particularly in a, in a world where, where our, our maximum resolution is one second? So uh, thinking about the, the traditional uh, engineering triangle, fast, good, or cheap, uh, we're, we're going to think about you know, what are some of the uh, valid values of, of the data that we're ingesting, and what are some of the queries that we're going to be asking of our data in order to be able to uh, balance these three factors uh, effectively and come up with a, a, a good answer. And that brings us to a, a data structure called uh, sketches. Uh, this is a, a data structure that comes to us from the stream processing literature, and it has a couple of, of properties that are uh, important. To, and and these, these properties are related, you can sort of imagine. But essentially what you're thinking about is uh, you want to examine each point in the stream that you're examining once. You don't want to go back and revisit that point every time you're doing a query. You actually want to only examine that point once. And you want to have a, a limited amount of, of memory usage um, in, in sort of the, the upper bound case, maybe a, a logarithmic to the size of the data stream. But um, you might actually even be able to do better than that. You might actually ha be able to have a, a absolute constant max upper bound. And we'll talk a little bit about how, um, how we're able to achieve that. 
So you might be familiar with, with some sketches. Uh, the uh, most famous one uh, is called uh, hyperlog log. Uh, you might use this today if you use the pf star uh, commands in Redis. Um, that's a, this is just an implementation of hyperlog log packaged up uh, in Redis. This is a cardinality estimator, so it tells you, you know, how many unique values are in a set. So if you wanted to know the unique number of visitors on your site, it would give you some answer, you know, plus or minus 2% or something like that. There are some other ones, bloom filters, frequency sketches, et cetera. But we're going to think about this in terms of that distribution uh, use case that I talked about at the beginning, the percentile latency, percentile request size, uh, SLOs, et cetera. Um, so what do, what do we mean by, by fast, good, and cheap in, in approximating distribution metrics? We need, them to, we need them to be accurate, of course. Um, we want them to be uh, fast. We need them to both be quick on insertion. So that means that we're minimizing the impact on our customers' uh, systems where they're running our agent. And then we also need them to be quick at query time, of course, because we talked about how we've done all of this work to make queries really fast. And we want them to be cheap. We want them to have a fixed size in memory, again, uh, you know, answering that, that sort of efficiency challenge and making sure that, that we're not doing anything more than necessary. So how do we approximate a distribution? A really common pattern is this one of a, a bucketed histogram is, is sort of the, the technical term that's used. But essentially, you can think of a distribution as this curve. And we're splitting the curve into discrete parts. And we're measuring the height at each uh, point, and then we're storing the height and the count as a bucket. So open metrics in, in Prometheus do this. Um, this is an example from uh, their documentation. Uh, you can see here this is a histogram of request duration, and we have some buckets, and there's on the, the right some counts, and sort of clean this up and, and make this a little bit easier to see. Hopefully my laptop's not blocking things too much. But uh, the, the, what we have here on the left is the time spent. Uh, and what we're saying is that each, at each level, there is a count of the number of requests that were less than the, uh, the limit here. So 50 milliseconds, 100, 200, 500 milliseconds a second, and then greater than a second. So if we want to know what our median latency is, given this kind of data structure, we need to look at the rank. And the rank here is out of 144,000 values, we want the middle one. So we want the 72nd thousandth value. Um, and that falls somewhere between 100 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds. And what do we do then? We use a technique called linear interpolation. We draw a line between those two buckets. And then we see where the 72nd value would, would fall on that line, assuming that all of the values in between those buckets are, are evenly distributed. And that gives us 158 milliseconds. What we don't actually know is what the real distribution of the values inside that bucket is. Are they close to 200 milliseconds? Are they close to 100 milliseconds? Maybe you don't care. Maybe knowing it's between 100 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds is good enough. Um, I would point out also in this example, if I wanted to know the 99th percentile latency, um, I actually don't have a good way of doing that because it falls into the last bucket. The last bucket is defined as anywhere between uh, one second and infinity. And there actually isn't a way to um, linearly interpolate that value. So I, I sort of have to throw up my hands and say, it was more than a second. Was it 10 seconds or 100,000 seconds? I don't really know. So there's another approach to, to answering this kind of query through a, a sketch data structure called uh, the GK sketch that is named for Greenwald and Kana. So they are uh, authors of a paper. Uh, and this sketch is designed around a concept called rank error. And what rank error means is they can give you a bounded response. That, uh, they can give you a bounded error on the response for a query of this data. And what they're going to say is, you know, you can choose you know, what granularity you want. But if I say I want it to be plus or minus 1% in rank, when I query for the 99th percentile, I will, get, I will be guaranteed to get a value between the 98th percentile and the 100th percentile, or the max. Um, and that's fine for certain distributions, but it's actually a challenge for tail distributions. And what we've seen is that the vast majority of data sets that people want to look at distributions across are really long tail distributions. Your request latency, like the, the alternative is there's like a big spike over on, on the, the left-hand side. And that's usually if you have like a timeout. So it's like there's like a big spike at the end that's like, oh, we hit 60 seconds. So everything falls in that bucket. But if you don't have a, a timeout like that, you know, your, your latency may, may just keep going all the way out there. And, and what you'll see is, is the GK sketch will give you values that sort of bounce around between the 98th percentile and the max. And that doesn't really give you a sense of where that real 99th percentile value is. 
what we found that we want um, and, and what our customers are interested in is something with a relative error guarantee. And this gives us a guarantee that the value that we return to you is within 1% of the actual value of the 99th percentile latency. And this, uh, what, we've, what we've seen is that this meets our, our customers' use cases uh, much, much better and, and provides you sort of a nice, clean distribution uh, reporting line uh, uh, and, and a metric that you can alert on uh, much more effectively. So coming back to our, our engineering triangle, thinking about uh, you know, what good means, good to us means this relative error where we're able to say 99% you know, of requests are guaranteed to be less than 505 milliseconds if you gave us an SLO of something like, you know, are 99% my, are of my requests less than 500 milliseconds? We can say, well, we're not sure exactly if they're less than 500 milliseconds, but we can say with 100% certainty that they're less than 505 milliseconds. And that's like pretty close. These are, this is a really inexpensive uh, data structure, so what, what we have a, a max bound, and the way that we're able to achieve that, we, we use 4,000 buckets, which is a lot more than the six that, that the open metrics example used, and, and open metrics could be extended. You could use as many buckets as you want, but you have to define them in advance. Um, there's a bunch of limitations around that. Um, and, and these, we create these dynamically, so we only use exactly as many buckets as we need, uh, if we ever ran into a case where we needed to use all 4,000 buckets and we needed a 4,000 and first bucket, what we would do is we would roll up those lower buckets um, because what we found, again, is that in, our, in the kinds of queries that our customers are asking, they're asking for that tail latency, that high end, 99th, you know, four nines of, of latency. They're not as interested in the, say, 10th percentile latency. That's generally not, not something that, that people are, are looking very closely at. So we can start to roll those buckets up. Now, it's worth noting that with 4,000 buckets, we've never actually needed to do this, again, just because of the, the shape of, of most customers' data. Um, but in theory, you know, we have that, that max bound. And then this is really fast. So this is, uh, you know, each insertion is two operations. You find the bucket, you increase the count. Um, it's, it's really a, a simple operation to uh, count these things this way. And then uh, queries just need to look at, at the range of buckets. And again, uh, you know, it could be up to 4,000. It's a, it's a constant factor, um, and it, it tends to be many, many less. So doing it uh, cheaper, we're leveraging uh, approximation to you know, answer these, these complex queries in a, a very efficient way. So the last part we'll talk about here is, is how do we actually use this data structure to get a even more flexible architecture? Uh, and that brings us to this, this concept of, of commutivity. So um, the, if something is commutative, we have this sort of the Wikipedia definition up here, but you think about like multiplication is commutative. So you say, you know, two times four equals four times two, right? And this is an important um, characteristic for aggregation. If you're averaging a series of values, you know, if, say I have one value that is the average of, of some number of values and I have a new value, I don't have a way to combine that average and a new value into a new average because I don't know what the weight of each of the, uh, what the weight of, of the number of, of values in that average is. So I don't know if I should count the new value as one-tenth of the total amount or one one-hundredth, et cetera. Um, so it's really, uh, what we're looking for actually in this data structure as well as all of the um, other properties is this concept of commutivity where I can have a new sketch, a smaller sketch, and a large sketch somewhere else in my pipeline, and I can put those together, and I can still get the same answer with the same kind of, of error guarantees that I'm looking for. Um, and this allows us to distribute work throughout our entire pipeline. Uh, so we can save work at different points and continue to merge things uh, partially throughout the process. Uh, so we can actually merge things in the agent. We can merge things in a new component, our streaming aggregator. We can merge things in the data store itself. We can even uh, cache partially merged uh, data in the query cache um, and, and as part of the query system. We can really distribute the work throughout the pipeline and, and do it you know, sort of at the last possible moment or do it as far in advance as possible depending on what the most efficient choice is. So this allows us to, to sort of fill in our, our last uh, performance mantra. So doing it while the user's not looking, we, can, we have that streaming aggregator that I mentioned that's collecting the data and, and doing a bunch of back-end processing so that these queries are, are super fast. 
So uh, we actually have uh, our own implementation of, of this uh, sketch data structure. Um, it's, it's, you know, builds on a lot of past literature, but it does have some novel aspects that I talked about. Uh, we'll actually be talking about it at uh, VLDB in August, um, which our, our data science team will be talking about it. We're very excited about that. And uh, we will be releasing um, open source standalone versions in several languages. It already exists in Go today as part of the Datadog agent, which is, of course, Apache licensed. So really what we're, what I, I want you to take away from this talk is you know, doing exactly the amount of work needed at exactly the right time and nothing more really gets you a lot in terms of the perf meeting your performance goals and building a, a highly scalable distributed data system. That's it, thanks.